U.S. support of IIT Campo was a visit of Prime Minister Nehru to Washington and on his birthday he met with uh, Pr President Kennedy who somewhat off the top of his head said, oh, we will support uh, <laughs> IIT Campo. Because the other countries had supported the other ones. Well, uh -huh. I'm not sure what the sequence was, uh -huh. but uh -huh. the idea was that different countries would support them. Uh -huh. And uh, Kennedy uh, quite clearly thought all he had to do was put in a call to Boston that was taken care of. <laughs> but in fact, what was necessary was to set up a consortium of originally 10 schools, but Stanford didn't answer it mail quickly enough, so it ended up being a nine-person consortium. Uh, my wife and I and uh, our one-year-old son were the third American family to arrive in Kampur. Of, of all the group, I mean, how big a group was it of Americans? Well, eventually it got up to 30, but oh. only much later. Mm -hmm. And anybody else from Purdue? At that time? Not, not at that time, although um, uh, later on uh, we had the libraries were in charge of Purdue. Anyway, um, we arrived in the uh, latter part of the monsoon season and it was hot and humid and a delegation of the local British population, there were a few of them still left even though independence had, had occurred invited us to go Scottish dancing on this monsoon <laughs> night. Uh, we politely declined. <coughs> At that time, uh, the classes were already underway. In fact, as I recall, uh, there had been a full freshman year and they were now on a sophomore year. But this was with a skeleton Indian staff and speaking for the chemistry, mm. it was a very mediocre stuff. Mm. I can't speak for the other departments, I don't know. How many students were there at that time? About? Uh, I think there were about 300 in the, in, oh, in the class. It was okay. considerable size. And it was a single curriculum. Everybody took the same thing. Now, our job was to prepare for the move to the new campus, which was under construction on the outskirts of Kampu. Uh, Initially, we were housed in what was called the Harcourt Butler Technical Institute, a sort of relic of British philanthropy, uh, but in a very beautiful setting, the, the Kamla Retreat. And um, they had freshman classes going, and they'd started a sophomore course, which in their wisdom they chose should be quantum mechanics. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we had to plan a laboratory for the new campus. Uh, the lab building was finished, but there were no benches, there were no utilities. And so the first thing we went was to went down to the market to talk to the Afghan carpenters who who were there and we ordered benches. Mm -hmm. Then we had to provide water but uh, Rudyard Kipling's bishtis, the Gunga Dins, were, were capable of walking up to a tank on the roof and putting water in it, which mm -hmm. is how we did it. Mm -hmm. And finally we needed gas and they had a machine which cracked petroleum into some form of gas. <laughs> I, all the time I thought it was going to blow up, but it never did. So you can gather things were fairly primitive. So no lab equipment, no... Uh, no, no. We, we went out and... Uh, well, there were some basic mm -hmm. test tubes and things, mm -hmm. but no special chemistry. And, uh, we went out uh, in a in a rickshaw <laughs> to the local bazaars and bought whatever chemicals we could find. 
And these were mainly, Kanpur was a, a, a town that made uh, fabrics. Mm -hmm. And so there were dyes and uh, things that uh, were used in the manufacture of cloth. Anyway, um, we finally got our act together. And in the July, which was the beginning of the school year, uh, July of... 1963, mm -hmm. we held our first classes in the new building. But fortunately, by that time, we had hired some decent people. Uh, the hiring process, and I was in charge of chemistry and chemical engineering, the hiring process was uniquely Indian. You invite applications mm -hmm. Uh, you sort through the best ones, nothing unusual in that, um, but then you invite them all on the same day. Uh -huh. And you give them an interview and look at the letters and ask them questions. And fortunately in chemistry, one of the first applicants was a Purdue graduate. Uh, in fact, in many ways, Purdue's most distinguished graduate, CNR Rao. Mm -hmm. Uh, we hired him on the spot. But we also hired uh, P.T. Narasimhan, a very good physical chemist, and uh, several other first-rate people. Was it necessary, I mean, was it, was it required to hire only Indians? Uh, uh, in, in oh, we, oh, yes. So the, 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 uh, the Americans made the decision, which I think was very wise, the, the Indian staff would remain just guests. They would not mm -hmm. hold any formal position. They were not head of the department. Mm -hmm. The British, on the other hand, appointed a Brit as head of the department. And, uh, so there were different approaches at different places. But we eventually, on that one day, ended up hiring seven people, mm -hmm. of whom I think six were of first class quality and two or three of them were, were truly outstanding. Hmm. A pretty good haul yes. uh, under the circumstances. And it was a nationwide search I yes. suppose. Uh -huh. And uh, chemical engineering a few weeks later was a similar procedure only it was hotter and uh, we met under a tent in Shamiana and uh, we again uh, they had a few better people than we had in chemistry uh, already, and we had a few more. Mm -hmm. Although there was a delay somewhat in the ceremony when the director of IIT Kampur waited until the stars were in a suitable astrological position <laughs> to favor the signing of new contracts. <laughs> uh, he was a highly uh, intelligent man and a, and a good uh, director, but he was very Indian in many, many ways. So uh, I was there for about uh, two months until I ca had to come home for fall at Purdue. So all in all, you were there for how long? Just in the over first? a year. Okay, so 1960... Uh, 62 to 63. Mm -hmm. Now in the intermediate years, as the program in Kanpur grew very rapidly, uh, I was the Purdue representative on the steering committee in this country. Ah. And the chairman of the steering committee happened to be Paul China, who was vice president of Batu. Hmm. And he and I used to fly to the meetings together. Back over to India? No. Oh. The meetings were at the consortium institution. Uh -huh. so at Princeton, at Caltech, mm -hmm. at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and so on. What were your duties then as, as so, uh, steering committee? Well, uh, uh -huh. in part giving advice, in part uh, helping select who was going to go. Oh, okay. uh, so still, still the choice of, of faculty. Uh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And eventually the faculty grew, I think, at its maximum to about 25. Mm. Uh, but uh, there were only... Uh, Two in chemistry, I believe. Truman Coleman, who was at Carnegie, yeah. and myself. But being on the Sierra Committee kept me in touch mm -hmm. 
and I therefore volunteered to go back again in 1970, uh, much to the dismay of the department head, and uh, probably to the detriment of my own career, but uh -huh. nonetheless I went back. By that time, uh, Kampur was pretty well established. Mm -hmm. They'd got some good Indian staff working, they'd got some good equipment. They had India's first computer, which we unloaded off a bullock cart. You, you mentioned that, and this was in the second, the second time you went No, there. this was on the first. Oh. But it, it was now uh, being used to train a whole host of Indians in summer schools. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you can train you can trace much of India's efflorescence in computer technology back to that bullet cart and that computer. And that computer. <laughs> anyway, uh, by the time we got back, although I taught uh, general chemistry in partnership mm. with CNR Round, mm. so Purdue uh, handled general chemistry, mm. um, I didn't really, they didn't have a great deal of need for me. Um, I gave advice here and there and mm -hmm. taught some courses. But the uh, embassy in Delhi decided I ought to go out as a goodwill chemical ambassador and give lectures all over India, mm -hmm. which I did, mm -hmm. and which I was very happy to be able to do, uh, some of which were fairly exciting adventures. Not only the lectures themselves, but getting there. Getting there. And, uh, on one occasion, we went to Pune, mm -hmm. where the uh, in, um, Indian Chemical uh, Institute is. And the head of that had, had done so, a study with Herb Brown. I got to know him. Mm -hmm. His name was Venkata Raman. And so I was going to a place where I knew the director of. Uh, and I lectured in spite of laryngitis. I had my first shot of penicillin in Pune, and last shot of penicillin in Pune. Mm -hmm. But then we started to come back to Bombay on the train, and it turned out that the uh, the local union workers were on strike. And the train was stoned as it went through the stations. <laughs> they, they closed the shutters, but there were bangings on, on the shutters. <laughs> but we finally made it uh, safely into uh, uh, Bombay and uh, stayed preparatory to go into the airport to fly back to Campo. Uh, when we got to the airport, um, I checked in the bags to the nearest imperial house. And then uh, I said, uh, is there any problems with the flight? And he said, well, yes, there is. Your plane is on fire. <laughs> and he said, look, and I looked out the window and the plane was <laughs> obviously on fire and beasties were on the wings trying to douse it from their bags. So we clearly couldn't leave. But uh, it was interesting because the crowd decided that uh, they had been saved from catastrophe by my son, who was almost two years old by that time. Uh -huh. And they kept touching him. He was blonde at that time. And uh, India's revere blonde mm -hmm. young people. Mm -hmm. Color is important to them. And they kept touching him. But this is the young man who saved us. It was Martin's <laughs> proudest moment, I think. <laughs> anyway, that was one of many examples, and uh, losing my papers up in Kashmir and rescuing them from a goat herd which trampled all over them. <laughs> and they, then giving uh, the lecture in the dark. Too. And the lecture in the dark. All, all sorts of stories that <laughs> one, could, one could tell. Mm -hmm. However, uh, IIT by 1970 uh, was a flourishing institution, already debatably the best technical institute in India. And its chemistry, uh, clearly, at that time, was mm -hmm. the best chemistry department in India. So it was a big success. And for me, it was a life changer because mm. I realized that I could do a lot of things 
I didn't know I could do, uh, but none of them were doing chemical research. <laughs> so that was the mm -hmm. Indian experience, mm -hmm. and it was a very powerful one. Well, by that time, you had, um, uh, at, at, at Purdue, you had you know, come into your own as a... Uh, uh, as, a, as a as a as a lecturer and as a as a as a um, as a as a as a, t as a, as a master teacher, um, uh, I'm I'm interested if, for you p pursuing that because you did you won some awards. I mean, I I have on the yeah, first one on my list is the Standard Oil uh, Teaching Award in 1970. So this is contemporaneous. Yeah, uh, I started being when I came back from India much more active in chemical education because mm -hmm. I'd, I'd belatedly come to the recognition that I wasn't going to make my fame and fortune as a researcher. Mm -hmm. And so I had to look for some other things I could do and uh, lecturing uh, both at home and across the country. I eventually ended up giving 500 lectures around the United States including every local section of the ACS. Everyone? Uh, Everyone, yeah. Hawaii and Alaska included, I would think. Alaska and Hawaii. Uh -huh. No, that's not true. Not every section. There were a few that didn't invite me, and I refused to invite myself. To their detriment. I don't know about that. Harvard didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, never do. Nor did Berkeley. Mm -hmm. No, I lectured at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I didn't lecture at Caltech. So anyway, uh, I was by then very, I'd had the experience of running the summer institutes for high school teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and in 64, I had the experience of going to Nigeria under the auspices of the Harvard Gradu Graduate School of Education. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting because for, for a variety of reasons, and we can come back to Lamidi later, but uh, but that was another uh, opportunity that did, did it come fluttering into the mailbox? Or something? No, it came uh, via a colleague in the biology department, Joe Novak, mm -hmm. who, Here who was invited to go on this trip to Nigeria mm -hmm. but couldn't. And he was asked if he knew any anybody mm. who might be qualified and interested in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And he put my name into the hopper. Mm -hmm. And so I was briefly a temporary member of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh -huh. So my education credentials were, were building, I mm -hmm. think. And um, by that time, uh, we about then hired Dudley Heron. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. In whose house we're now sitting. Mm -hmm. And Dudley's specialty was chem uh, chemical education. Um, he had got a uh, master's degree in uh, physical chemistry, but then a PhD in uh, chemical education. And he, he became a, a one of the real prophets of the emerging area mm -hmm. of chemical education. Uh, although I was associated with them uh, then and later on, in fact, until my retirement, I was never a, a real um, fully accepted member of chemical education because I'd never had a course in education in my life. I should think they would qualify you even more. Well, <laughs> let's not be cynical. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, they hired people uh, such as um, George Bodner, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Knackley, later on Gabriella Weaver, and Bill Robson Robinson defected from inorganic chemistry into chemical education. Mm -hmm. And by the middle to late 80s, uh, Purdue had become the leader in chemical education in this country. Which may still well be, and would you say? And it quite possibly still is. I mean, there are, few, there are only a few other PhD programs. More and more oh, are really? offering it, okay. yes. Okay. But we, we led the way. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my involvement was... Uh, <clears throat> Somewhat peripheral, I was involved in the ACS Division of Chemical Education, of which I became chairman. I and was heavily involved in the Journal of Chemical Education, and uh, 
it was then I got the ACS award in chemical education. And and from from early on in your career here at Purdue, or uh, did it sort of sort of drift in uh, through the? No, background? early on I had nothing to do with the division of chemical education. Uh -huh. It it happened after about fifteen years at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I guess when I realised that I wasn't going to be a researcher and I was looking for something else. So. Uh, so, I, but, but there are. I mean, I'm I'm looking at my little list of awards. There's a. Standard Oil, Manufacturing Chemist, uh, Chemist Association, Chem Teaching Award uh, in 1976, the Indiana Academy of Science, Lecturer of the Year. Yeah. And then, as you mentioned, the ACS Award in Chemistry, which is a, 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 a high award, the highest award in that area, in Chem Ed in 1981. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I made a mark in chemical education in about 10 years, mm -hmm. I think published a number of highly literate and uh, influential articles. Not, yes. a, not a large number, but uh -huh. people still speak of some of them. Elevate them guns a little lower, for instance. And the famous uh, um, silver... Uh, silver chloride is a pilgrim, yes. yes. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, that phase of my life, I think, was successful. Mm -hmm. Now, history was another matter. As I mentioned, I'd always been interested in the history of chemistry. Well, in fact, history in general, but mainly through Shakespeare's plays. But history of chemistry in particular, and unfortunately he didn't write any plays about that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I worked it in, as I had mentioned previously, into that course for humanities students, which I taught. I put a lot of history in that. And then I became active in the Division of History of Chemistry of the ACS. And one of the, my jobs was to serve on a committee. I wasn't chair of it, I was just a member, mm -hmm. which in fact chose the location for the Center for History of Chemistry, ah. now called the mm -hmm. Chemical F uh, Heritage, Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. And later on I was to spend a sabbatical at, in Philadelphia mm -hmm. at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. So history now became a, a significant part of my interest and relatively soon uh, I became chairman of the Division of History of Chemistry following being chairman of the Div Division of Chemical Education. Yeah, well, Chem Ed is a, is, a, is a huge division in the history. Is history is relatively small yeah, and uh -huh. uh, was often described as a place with little old ladies in tennis shoes, <laughs> which was unkind. There were a few good historians in there, but it, it was mainly a, a pretty amateur operation. Mm -hmm. But Bill Jensen and I decided to try and uh, shape it up. And amongst other things, uh, with my encouragement as chairman, Bill founded the Bulletin for History of Chemistry. Bill, I will do... Uh, Bill Jensen. Uh, yeah, his, his uh, parent, he's, a, well, he's got his PhD at Wisconsin. Got his PhD in chemistry. In chemistry, in Wisconsin, but was yeah. interested in history and, and more or less from the beginning. In, in the University, now, University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Uh -huh. yeah. and the, the journal became eventually an internationally accepted journal mm -hmm. in the history of chemistry. Mm -hmm. Now that was Bill Jensen's doing, but I encouraged and uh, submitted articles, and more particularly, ran a number of stellar and I use the word uh, deliberately, mm -hmm. stellar symposia on history of chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, the one on G.N. Lewis had three Nobel Prize winners and six other members of the National Academy on the program. Quite a, quite a, as you say, stellar. Uh, and uh, similar symposia on um, John Dalton, on J Joseph Priestley, mm -hmm. and uh, Michael Faraday, and then, in a sort of tribute to my own origins, a, a symposium on C.K. Ingold. Mm. Ah, okay. So, and these were almost all written up and published in the bulletin. Mm -hmm. So I was indirectly supplying Bill with quite a lot of his copy. And to get three Nobel Prize winners and six members of the National Academy all to submit manuscripts <laughs> was, was an achievement of which I'm very proud. I, I should think. Mm -hmm. Well, there was Pauling, 
and uh, Paul and Calvin and Glenn Seaborg. And Glenn Seaborg. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, and in fact, my one of my most memorable moments, <laughs> Paul w was about to give his lecture, but we were on intermission. And he said, do you know where the restroom is? And I said, yes, I'll take you to it. So Pauling and I stalked off to the restroom and were standing at the urinals doing a business. Mm -hmm. And I happened to mention that old Glenn Seaborg said something. And a voice above my right ear said, <laughs> what is old Glenn Seaborg saying? <laughs> I was at the urinal midway between Linus Pauling and Glenn Seaborg. It was my uh, <laughs> highest moment, I think. Anyway, um, it all went well, and I probably would have continued until the end of my career, but a, a malevolent spirit called John Wotis sort of sabotaged Bill Jensen mm -hmm. and indirectly myself. And uh, though the journal continues, I had relatively little to do with the division mm -hmm. after Wotis uh, basically sued the journal for some reason. I ah, forgot. Okay. So, so he was he was instrumental in well, he was a member of the the, oh, his, he, the, yes, the, the was, history. And uh, you know, was a worthy member, but he was a uh, interfering a, nasty man. Mm -hmm, an interfering nasty man. Nice to so, see. So anyway. <laughs> the, uh, Later on, uh, in fact, my last year of teaching, uh, I was invited to give the Woodrow Wilson summer lectures at Princeton. I'd already given them in the early 80s on inorganic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And in, eight, in 94, I went back and gave a summer institute in the history of chemistry. Huh. So um, this was yet another mm -hmm. uh, outreach sort of program, this time in the history of chemistry at Princeton. And 94 was your, your last year? My last year at Purdue of teaching. So, uh -huh. okay. so you retired uh, in It was the hardest mm -hmm. four weeks, no, was it four weeks or six weeks? Mm -hmm. Hardest I've ever worked because I was giving lectures, organized visitors, organizing labs, mm -hmm. Uh, it was brutally difficult, but it was very successful, and I'm still in touch with a number of the people who took mm -hmm. the course there. Mm -hmm. um, now, in, um, um, but you have, uh, since your retirement, you have remained uh, active because I know, uh, just like uh, uh, Bill Jensen, you uh, you um, you catalyzed my own interest in a whole bunch of things by dropping these gems and. Uh, Watching me snuffle them up, so uh, I know that you've been. You've been I, 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 when it, when invited, I have uh, given lectures, but I've no longer was organizing big symposia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was no longer, uh, although I had been chairman of the division, uh, I didn't hang on as a counselor or anything of that sort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea when you, you've done most of what you can do is to get the hell out and let young people, younger people at least, uh, see what they can do. I have the same feeling myself. Uh, uh. So, now I think that um, quite possibly covers my chemically related mm -hmm. Professional career, and but that's certainly not the the the, the least of your uh, um, contributions to uh, the, to oh, the life at the, Purdue. Not um, the least, I hope, because that's how I earned my living for forty well, years. Well, I mean, it is it, it's yeah. not the least, but but uh, other I mean, there were some other very yeah, interesting. Yeah, there were other areas into which I got uh, involved. And again, it goes back to my very early interest in the humanities. And I think it, it started, um, well, it started in the 60s when Purdue founded a Senate, mm -hmm. faculty Senate, and Dale Marjoram and I were the first two senators from representing chemistry. And it was a fairly lively body at that time. I think it's a pretty perfunctory body now. In fact, I'm not even sure it still exists. Oh, yes. Uh, but if it does, it's it's relatively perfunctory, I think. But more interesting was that in the 70s, I was invited to serve on the Convocations Committee. 
Now, Convocations was a much more uh, active program than it is now. And indeed, when I first came to Purdue, uh, students got a free ticket to all the convocations, and mm. faculty paid $15 for 20 convocations. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Metropolitan Opera played two nights here. I mean, it was, it was big-time stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, being invited onto the committee was fine. But uh, I served on the committee, but they had a full-time director of convocations. And they also had a wonderful director of uh, Purdue uh, Theatre, a man called Joe Stockdale, I knew, I knew very well. But I was finally seconded to run, firstly, the Chamber Music Society. Purdue had four chamber music concerts each year in Loeb Theatre. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was uh, privileged to play Prince Esterhazy and choose the programs for these. Uh, <laughs> each quartet or trio would mm -hmm. submit a program, and uh, you you could choose which one you wanted them to play. So I, I just more or less did that off my own bat, and it, it certainly broadened my own education of classical music. So that was one one thing. And uh, the second thing was, uh, after the chamber music, I was put in charge of the lectures part of lectures and convocations. Mm -hmm. And that is when, uh, for two years, all of the lecturers who appeared in the Hall of Music or in Loeb Theatre uh, were either chosen by me or invited by me because mm -hmm. it was it was a very small committee mm -hmm. but we got some fascinating people um, for instance john kenneth galbraith was one of them whom i had met when he was ambassador in india another tall uh, barry fellow. goldwater was another <laughs> uh, linus pauling was another mm -hmm. uh, buckminster fuller was another and Lucas Foss, the musician, uh, I invited him to give a lecture on aleatory music, the music of chance. And he wrote back and said, I'd be happy to give a lecture, but why don't we do a performance? And he sent me a list of instruments, which I had to locate. And so I went to the Purdue bands trying to locate uh, particularly percussion instruments, because he brought two members of the Buffalo Philharmonic with him, Richard Dufallo and uh, I forgot his first name, his second name was Desroches, who was the mm -hmm. timpanist. And they played after uh, a few introductory items and a, a short introduction to aleatory music by Lucas Foss. Um, they then played one of Foss's pieces. And it was fascinating because the music, which was fairly atonal, but quite listenable. But there came a point where the percussionist took a iron rod and banged an anvil. And at that point, everybody playing had to jump back to an earlier place in the score. <laughs> but he, there was no specific place. He did it when he felt like it. And so it, the thing went backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. but eventually uh, it came to a uh, exuberant ending. And I remember the audience stormed the stage, and Seymour Benzer, a very distinguished molecular biologist who later went to Caltech, leapt up on the stage and banged the, <laughs> the bang the <laughs> it was It was a glorious night. <laughs> But it wasn't quite over. We had a reception for um, for him, and I I took Lucas Fast back to the house uh, where we were holding the reception. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Gass, a rather well-known novelist, uh, who won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, he was hosting it. He's a faculty member. Yeah, he was. He then moved after the uh, disturbances in the sixties. He moved to. Uh, St. Louis University. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, um, I, I took gas there, and uh, he had been uh, hadn't had much sleep, 
and uh, because the plane was and they hadn't had much rehearsal mm -hmm. and in fact they rehearsed in a room in the union which I didn't know existed surrounded by the US dance troupe who were using the same room <laughs> it was a totally chaotic day and it ended chaotically <laughs> Because Lucas Foss, because we arrived early, said, I'll go and take a few minutes sleep. Mm -hmm. So he disappeared, and I'd invited some people to Bill Gassie's house. And they came, but the other two musicians didn't arrive. <coughs> and eventually, about three quarters of an hour later, they showed and they said, Oh, we went to the wrong reception across the road. <laughs> Uh, I for the I think it was the Republican Women's Club, and he couldn't. Un these two musicians couldn't understand why nobody mentioned the concert. And eventually, they saw lights across the street, and we finally uh, we finally got them together. So it was a almost fit for a Marx Brothers uh, interlude. <laughs> So that was uh, one of the musical things. The other was Buckminster Fuller, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was then uh, the height of his uh, New Age guru status. Uh -huh. And he, he, a very creative man, Buckminster Fuller. And, uh, but he'd become a sort of guru of the, the new wave. Uh -huh. And he arrived uh, quite late. And uh, we got him on stage. He had three watches on his hand. On his arm. Uh -huh. uh, one was Southern Illinois time, which is where he was located at that time. Mm -hmm. The other was Greenwich Mean Time, and the third was what he called Intergalactic Time. Uh -huh. And uh, so at eight o'clock, uh, uh, I, I, in fact, I got the Vice President, Paul Tina, to introduce him. And. Uh, Paul Tina in, in introduced him, but, but then Buckminster Fuller started talking and talking and talking. Fascinating, but mm -hmm. for about an hour and three quarters he talked. And people were beginning to look at their watches because it was like Dick Walton, it was their bedtime. Mm -hmm. And so uh, finally he said, uh, well, maybe I should show my slides after <laughs> an hour and three quarters. So the curtains parted and he started showing slides. <coughs> and uh, so the, the slides were interesting and he mm -hmm. as always was interesting and uh, we finally got him off the stage at a quarter to eleven <laughs> now the hostess of the reception was getting a little antsy because we said we'd be arriving about 9.30 <laughs> uh, but we showed up uh, but with Fuller was a, a fine fellow and uh, the party was going and uh, I sat down with a drink which I badly needed. He didn't drink but he had a coke or something and it was about the time of fullerenes. Oh yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and it was also the time of book Mr. Fuller's geodesic domes. Geodesic domes yeah. So I said, oh, we've now made molecules which are like your geodesic domes. And he said, what are they? And I said, well, they're this. And I tried to draw um, the, what later became called a Buckminster Fullerene. Buckminster Fullerene. Uh -huh. And it was very hard to draw, but he immediately grasped the three-dimensional nature of the five and six-membered rings. Mm -hmm. And he was quite fascinated by this. Now that wasn't the reason that it was caught. Somebody else called it Buckminster Fullerian. Mm -hmm. But I had this paper napkin on which Buckminster Fuller drew all these variations on Buckminster Fullerian as it was later called. Unfortunately, I got rid of it and I, I oh, no longer have it. It would have been a sort of historical artifact. Nice keepsake. Mm -hmm. um, another exciting time was when we invited Pauling, because in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh -huh. and he was a very outspoken opponent of it, as was J. Kenneth Galbraith. And so I, I, you know, he was a 
distinguished. I think he received only the first of his two Nobel Prizes, but he was a very prominent peace activist. In fact, he was doing more of that than chemistry at mm -hmm. that time. And I asked the uh, vice president to introduce him, and he said, no, I'm sorry, I've got an engagement that night. Well, so I invited the dean, and he said, I'm sorry, I've got another engagement that night. <coughs> And so I thought, what the hell, I'll invite Paul. I'll introduce Paul. Mm -hmm. So there was a tremendous crowd, and we had an overflow system in the other hall in, in Stuart Center. So it was, he, was, it, he was in Elliot Hall then? No, he, he was not in Elliot, oh. because we didn't expect such a huge audience right. when he was first invited. Mm -hmm. He was in Loeb. He was in Loeb. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and so, uh, finally, uh, I arrived, and uh, uh, he uh, he gave his lecture, mm -hmm. very impassioned uh, opposition to the course of the war in Vietnam. But when I was giving my introduction, I looked out, and to my surprise, sitting in the audience were the vice president and the dean. They thought it politically wise mm -hmm. in the state of Indiana uh, not to be on the same platform as Linus Pauling. Those Pauling. were the days. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So Pauling um, gave a, a, a very good lecture, and I said, will you take questions, Professor Pauling? Oh, yes, I, I want questions. And amongst other things, he was handing out numbers for people who wanted to go to Canada to escape the draft. And I mean, it's no wonder that the dean and the vice president were a little scared of what was going to happen. But it went, it went smoothly enough. The, 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 uh, there were no hecklers? There were no... Uh, no. no. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote, uh, he said, uh, I'd asked him if he'd give another lecture for very bright sophomores, mm -hmm. as I put it. He said yes, and he gave me a title on uh, proteins, genes, and evolution, or something mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. wide ranging. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'd also like to give a lecture to the physics department on my theory of the nuclear atom. So I call up the physics and say, uh, Would you like a lecture from Nobel laureate Linus Pauling on nuclear theory? And they uh, somewhat reluctantly said yes, because the theory wasn't widely uh, mm -hmm. acknowledged. So we went, he went over to the physics department. I took Mrs. Pauling, who had been talking to the faculty wives for peace, I took her over, Ava Helen, mm -hmm. and she and I stood at the back at the physics department when he was introduced and started his lecture. Now, for reasons best known to himself, he was using a new Polaroid pro process. And uh, he showed his first slide, but it was a four by three slide, instant, <coughs> instant slide making machine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we had to exhume an old projector from the basement which we could handle these slides. <coughs> Unfortunately, it had a very hot uh, arc light behind it. Mm -hmm. And after Pauling had spoken for a few seconds on his first slide, it melted, yeah, and it was like a uh, d Dali uh, drip <laughs> painting. The slide melted down into a mechanism, and it jammed. <laughs> and uh, he said, you have another projector? No. Give me an overhead. So he got an overhead. And he drew all his remaining slides from memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he did not convince the physicists that his theory was a great advance. And indeed, I think history has shown that it has had little impact. Mm -hmm. Well, but he it was, was typical of Pauling that he would come up with a, a theory of nuclear stability. Yeah. And, and but he was a, a busy man. If this was a, if this was a th the third third lecture. But this was the first time he'd spoken on it. Oh. On, but he had published some uh, brief articles on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, his third lecture was the next day in chemistry, in room oh. 200. Mm -hmm. 
and my god I wasn't going to have the slides burn up in chemistry so <laughs> we had the slide projector in the booth at the back mm -hmm. and I had another slide projector in the middle of the auditorium as a backup uh, but in the booth you couldn't really hear what was being said uh, they didn't provide a mic in the booth mm. at that time mm -hmm. so uh, there was a huge crowd they were sitting all up and down the aisles mm -hmm. and uh, Herb Brown arrived late for the lecture I was in the booth because I was going to stand outside and tell the projectionist next slide please next mm -hmm. slide please mm -hmm. next slide please mm -hmm. And Herb looked and said, is there any place where uh, I can sit? He didn't want to slit, sit in the aisle. I said, no, Herb, but you can come and help work the slide machine. <laughs> so Herb came into the projection booth, and Pauling went on. Fortunately, there were no further uh, problems. And uh, the, uh, the lecture went to a triumphant conclusion. Uh -huh. It was one of the most brilliant summaries that I've ever heard in my life. Pauling was, I think without question, the, in his prime, the mm. greatest lecturer I've ever heard. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just the famous. Even late in his life, he was, I heard him at Cornell in the Dubai Symposium. Uh, he, he could still give a pretty spellbinding lecture. But this was a this was part of the, uh, of the general was, university lecture series yes, that he yes. was. not not chemistry. This is mm -hmm. a general university mm -hmm. lecture. Mm -hmm. I think that's covered most of my uh, out, uh, non chemistry activities, with one exception. With one big exception, mm -hmm. and that was um, I had by that time and thereafter started collecting art. Uh, this really started in India where. There were very few modern artists, but you could get to know most of them fairly easily, mm -hmm. and I did. And later on, uh, going up to Canada for the Stratford Festival, I collected Inuit art. And in 1964, when I went to Nigeria, I met a woodcarver called Labidi Fake, who turned out to be, later on, Africa's best-known woodcarver and had a solo exhibition at the Smithsonian. So uh, I was collecting art and uh, I grew friendly with the director of Purdue Galleries, Mona Berg, a very handsome lady, and we put on our first exhibition uh, exactly 30 years ago, it was in 79, and it was on the art of cartooning. And uh, much of it was on uh, Gilray cartoons, which I later gave to the Center of History of Chemistry. These were Gilray cartoons of Joseph Priestley, contemporary cartoons. Mm -hmm. And I had a collection of about 15 of these, which I think was the largest outside the British Museum of Priestley Gilray cartoons. And uh, you, you collected those? Words. Well, I collected them in London and in Detroit. Uh -huh and by mail from London. Mm -hmm. So that was our first, and we had Draper Hill, who was uh, the editorial cartoonist of the Detroit News. And in fact, he drew a cartoon of me, which appeared on the cover of the Journal of Chemical Education. Yes, and but that was the first of my collaborations with uh, Mona. Mm -hmm. uh, we later had quite a number of others, in collaboration not only with Mona but with um, Alfred Bader, we put on three exhibitions. Uh, the first one was prompted by Herb's Nobel Prize when I arranged to have four speakers. Mm -hmm. For some reason I was put in charge of the celebration. Uh, we arranged to have four speakers uh, and uh, we got E.J. Corey, Al Cotton, Raoul Hoffman, mm -hmm. and of course, Herb Brown himself. Mm -hmm. And Alfred Bader was to give the dinner talk. Now, Alfred Bader was the president, at that, at that time, was president of Aldrich. Aldrich Chemical, Chemical, and a, a very well-known collector. Mm -hmm. uh, that exhibition uh, was Rembrandt and his students, ah. and old masters and old students. 
And we had two Rembrandts in that show, as well as a total of 16 other mm -hmm. painters by very well-known Dutch artists. It was probably the um, highest quality exhibition that we ever had at Purdue. Where, where did the Rembrandts come from? Alfred Bader. He just brought them in his suitcase or something? No. We mm -hmm. went up and collected them. Moto went up and collected them. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I've forgotten. I'm not sure. I know Mona took them back. I've forgotten. Maybe I picked them up. I don't know. Uh, we had to install a special security system. Of course. Uh, but it was a great success. And uh, Herb always hoped that all three speakers other than himself would also get Nobel Prizes. Well, Cor Corey did. Hoffman did. Uh -huh. But Alcott never made it. No, he didn't. Not quite. Uh, Another exhibit that was uh, on the arts in India, and uh, we had three galleries, four galleries actually. One was of fabrics, one was of contemporary Indian art, hmm. and uh, one was on folk art of India. And. Uh, so uh, all, all that were, it, were areas that you were, uh, yeah. were interested in and had some and had some examples of too. Yes, mm -hmm. I contributed, but uh, mm -hmm. there were lots of other contributors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Rembrandt exhibit, I, I had no contributions to that. So that was <laughs> Beda, and in fact, Beda put on two more exhibits here. The most interesting, to my mind, was. Uh, old timers will remember that the covers of Aldrich Chemical Octa used to have a old master's painting on the cover, mm -hmm. and he brought the originals of all these old master paintings that had appeared on the cover of yep. Aldrich Chemical Octa, and uh, it was a very very interesting exhibit because mm. we had the chemical literature and we had old master paintings blended together. Um, and then uh, Ralph Hoffman uh, had written a book in collaboration with a woman called Vivian Torrance um, on chemistry and <coughs> the imagination. Mm -hmm. And uh, the exhibit was to be at Purdue. And he wrote to me and said, uh, I'd like you to supervise the installation of the exhibit. <laughs> uh, he was coming for the opening, but mm -hmm. uh, had to be put up. And so Raoul came and uh, uh, gave a very uh, literate uh, lecture, as only Raoul can. And the exhibit was really a very interesting one, although I don't think Vivian Torrance's uh, collages were, were that striking, but uh, it was an interesting exhibit. Uh, the final one I'll mention, there were two or three other smaller ones, uh, is my um, farewell exhibit. On retirement, I decided to put my whole art collection on exhibit called Ars Longa. Vita, uh, Bursa, not Vita, Bursa Brevis. <laughs> Art is long, the pocketbook is short. But it was an attempt to show what you could do. Uh, I was never one of the highest paid Purdue faculty members. But if you kept your eyes open and went to interesting places, you could assemble some interesting art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the centerpiece of the uh, exhibit I had commissioned from La Midi Faquet, the Nigerian sculptor, by which time I got to know him quite well and he'd stayed at my house several times. I comm commissioned an eight foot tall veranda post. As, uh, to our left as we sit uh, here. Uh, which is still. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was the center, but there were lots of other things. Uh, there were Indian things, there were Eskimo pieces which mm -hmm. I had collected. And there were about 70 pieces of art in that exhibit. And uh, I gave an informal lecture, but mm -hmm. the exhibit was the center of attraction. And Lamidi sat in the exhibit and did some carving. 
I oh, mean, really? he, he actually put on communist ways. Hmm. So that, I think, was the one that gave me most personal pleasure, uh, was because the collection stood up very well when it was put like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, that, was, that was at the end of your... That was the end. I, I forgot one other in the oh. middle. And that was a, an exhibit uh, about a man I greatly admire, uh, James Houston, who, as a Canadian, who introduced Inuit Eskimo art to the southern part of Canada. Uh, he was an artist himself. He was an administrator of Baffin Island. He wrote books. And later in his life, he became a chief designer for Stuben Glass in New York. Oh. Very, very talented man. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's strange that three of the most interesting men I've ever met were Canadian. John Kenneth Galbraith, mm -hmm. uh, James Houston, and the man who founded the Stratford Festival. Oh, really? Uh, who was actually a fairly lowly newspaper man who had a vision. And uh, the vision became the Stratford. finest Shakespearean theater in North America. Um, so uh, these, these were some of the uh, non-chemical things which made life at Purdue for me particularly interesting. Well, I should think it made it interesting for lots of other people too. And I think I should say that if I had uh, been good enough to get a job at Princeton or even Michigan, um, let alone uh, Caltech or MIT, I never would have been able to indulge in all of these things. I mean, you don't get chemists um, <laughs> running things at, at Princeton who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are not professional art historians. You don't get music who are not professional musicians. It's so Purdue gave me wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. to indulge many of my uh, heart's desires. And I took full advantage of it. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I think um, I, I have to stop it now.